Just as a quick introduction to me, I spent uh, the past two decades trying to figure out what's broken about the way that we try to build large-scale software. And the first 10 years of that was working as an open source developer. I wrote a ton of code, uh, did a bunch of research at Xerox Spark, worked on the Eclipse IDE, uh, did my PhD at the University of British Columbia to try to figure out how we can make our coding activities, really going from code to deployment to cloud, about 10 times more productive and realizing that, that, that we can't, um, that we're basically getting diminishing returns at that point. I then spent 10 years um, building a company. This is now Tastop and working with global 200 and global 500 organizations uh, to try to figure out how to take some of the ideas that did work in open source in terms of the kind of very fast flow and feedback loops and, and learning that we have in those kinds of software projects to large scale enterprise IT. And through that, I got to learn just how big a disconnect and chasm there is. And as you may have heard Gene say this morning, I've tried to capture the, these ideas in this new book on IT Revolution Press, um, really inspired by what Gene has been doing with this community and with every one of you, and the book is called Project to Product. So it's how to survive and thrive in the age of the digital disruption with this new thing I'm going to show you today, a preview of it actually, uh, called the Flow Framework. The book's going to ship at DevOps and Price Summit in Vegas in, in the fall, in October. So. So the book is kind of anchored around three epiphanies that I learned through this, this journey of the last two decades. So the first one is that we've got this very large disconnect between what we're used to as those of you who have done development in the software architecture and then the thing that shapes the software architecture, what we now call the value stream. And these, are, these, these structures don't quite align. There's this bigger mismatch I'll tell you a bit about. Um, that software value streams, you know, in my career as a developer, getting connected to them properly, understanding what I should be working on, what the flow of work was, what the demand and the feedback from our users was, was really critical. Uh, and we made some tools to do that better. But as I got to working with large organizations, I got a sense for how just, just how broad these value streams are and how many IT specialists, not, you know, it's not just ops, it's also business analysts and designers and the support teams. And there's this whole wor world of ITSM out there as well. Um, and each of these are underrepresented at the various conferences that you go to. We've stovepiped our conferences the same way that we have our tools and our organizations. So there's something fundamentally wrong there. And again, we needed some breakthroughs to see through that. And then finally, in trying to understand how this has worked in previous ages uh, and how we solve these problems with large-scale manufacturing, which I'll get into in a moment, um, I had this third epiphany that things are, are fundamentally different in software. That while we're trying to make our delivery pipelines be linear, they're actually not. There's some other bigger problem here. These value streams are they're these more complex learning networks and dynamic systems. So I'll touch on each of those things. But first, I'll start by giving a bit of historical context, because I think we're, we all have a sense of how, through our, basically our entire careers, the pace of change we've been seeing in technology has been tremendous. It seems every time we learn something at a conference, we go back to organizations, something changes. You know, one of the big tech giants has a, a new platform, a new automation technology, um, a new toolkit, and so on. And so we've had this tremendous pace of change that's very difficult as technologists and as business leaders to keep up with. And it feels like it's been this way forever, because it basically has been this way our entire, entire career. But if we look at what Gene introduced today, he actually introduced this work to me about a year ago, the work of Carlota Perez. If you zoom out of our career spans, which are 20, 30 years or so, 40 years, uh, she has this model, which is based on the model of Kondratiev waves, these long waves of economic progress, of technological revolutions. If you zoom out, it actually looks like we're in this very specific point of this particular technological revolution. So in this age of, of software and of digital. And each of these waves has had this installation period where the new technology, be that electricity, be that railways or steam or something else, uh, is basically starts maturing. And the new organizations start learning how to leverage it. And you end up with this, uh, the organizations who learn how to leverage it, for example, the, uh, the railroad companies um, and the robber barons, amassing more and more wealth as they figure out how to leverage this new means of production and often leaving a big chunk of the economy behind. And then we shift into this new period, in this, these, these golden ages and so on. And so it looks like, and I've, I've had some conversations with Carlotta Perez uh, since that time, um, it looks like we're right now in this turning point, in the point where we're moving from this installation period to this deployment period. And that would actually explain the sort of change that we're seeing, how much disruption there is, and how quickly the technology platforms are shifting. And so it looks a little bit like this, as Gene showed you, where you've got these, decade, like these two or three decades um, of installation period. And what's really fascinating about these installation periods is during that time, there's a lot of financial capital. So this is where 
financial capital can make its 10x returns. And if you look at what's happening to a lot of the companies represented in this room, this is just the visualization by CB Insights. And if you look at after the stock, or during the stock, if you like, if it's boring, you can Google for uh, unbundling of and CB Insights. You'll actually see these really cool graphics of the unbundling of a bank. And so this is an illustration of a bank's website. And you see there are about a couple thousand fintech startups out there today. And they're going after every single part of the financial experience. Right? There's all this v venture capital uh, funding the disruption of a bank and every single, single aspect of the banking, ex banking experience. And so this is the kind of thing that happens in this installation period. So in Detroit, there used to be around 300 car startups. But then we shift into this at the turn of the century. Um, we shift into this deployment period. And the deployment period, some companies have figured out how to master the new means of production and how to master it not just from a technology point of view, but from kind of a, a whole company point of view. And so we're seeing this. And we've got, you've heard Gene refer, refer to the FANGs today, uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. They have mastered this new means of production. They have, within their organizations, they have these connected value stream networks. Uh, companies like Microsoft have 3,500 developers working on their internal tools, the tools that they use to build their software. So these are, whether you think of them as the amazing innovators providing us some products that we're now completely dependent on, whether you think of them as the new robber barons, these, these are the companies that have mastered software at scale. And what's interesting is these companies are getting better at moving into other businesses than traditional businesses that grew up in the last stage are getting good at building software. And this has some potentially dire consequences because what it means is that a lot of those companies might not make it through that turning point, might not last through uh, that deployment period. It's, we're actually seeing already, because these things are always a little bit fuzzy, we're seeing signs of even unicorn-like startups not being able to make it. So here's an example of a company I really like, Jawbone, they used almost all of their devices. They had $930 million of venture capital. So, and they failed completely. You cannot compete against the production capital of Apple even in this period anymore. That production capital has gone that powerful. It'd be very difficult right now to compete against the production capital of Facebook if you're building a social network. They will buy you or they can replace you uh, with, by, by re-implementing your feature set. So I think Gene's call to action to us was that we can make it through here, that we can, can take these practices. Um, but I think if we keep going at it the way we have been, uh, most of the companies who grew up in that last age will not make this transition. Through the, through the turning point. And so in the book, I go through some of these case studies, again, to figure out how we can avoid this and how we can end up with a world that's got a much broader economy and distribution of wealth than if five or six companies control the majority of it. So, so I got to witness some of these failures firsthand because some of them happened early, some happened late. And uh, Nokia was, I think, one of the fascinating ones uh, because Nokia, they were, if, for those of you who are around the Agile conference you know, around 2009, 2008, those years, they were a poster child for transformation. So all of the Agile consultants were using Nokia saying, yes, Agile works at scale. Yes, you can do this. You can do what Nokia did. And then it, I actually had a chance to work with Nokia. They're one of our first customers. And the way that they were measuring how Agile they were um, was by how many people, they had this thing called the Nokia test actually, no, developed by Nokia Siemens Networks, was how many people were trained on Scrum. So now think back, I hope all of you saw John Smart's talk this morning, and think back to that kind of longer value stream of his. So not only were they, the yay were agile, tiny segment over here that they were focused on at the business level, the only way they were even testing how agile they were was if someone was trained on Scrum. And in the meantime, their bottleneck had nothing to do with how many people were trained on Scrum. They, were, they had a platform, this Series 60 operating system, which was, had so much technical debt in it that even if someone handed them a capacitive touch screen and said, okay, you know, make this thing work, it's now gonna be a bigger screen that's easier to touch and a bit heavier, um, they had no chance to innovate on software that quickly. This was a company, it was over 100 years old, who got to making some beautiful, and amazing, I had that phone, beautiful and amazing devices in terms of mastering mass manufacturing, but they never, at a business level, made the transition to the age of software. The people I knew at, at Simeon at the time, they, they actually were great technologists and great software people, but Nokia as a company did not understand what technical that was. 
at the leadership level. So how could you replatform the way Amazon replatforms, spend probably a billion dollars replatforming when you don't actually understand those dynamics of software and how software innovation value streams work? And it's similar for a lot of other organizations. So I've had a chance to witness a, a top 25 bank make those same Nokia-like mistakes over and over again. So three failed transformations, each of which looks like it's on track because they're, tra they're tracking the activities of the transformation. How many people are using this tool or how many people are trained on Scrum rather than actually looking at those outcome-based metrics. So there's just something fundamentally wrong with this approach. And we see these common problems in our companies. IT seems disconnected from the business. Leadership is tracking activities, not results. Um, project funding, there's something wrong with it because projects end, they haven't delivered success. Um, IT seems to be solving its own problems, not the business problems. And then to the business leaders, IT feels like a black hole. And to the technologist, the business feels like it's always buffeting them in this or that direction uh, and never giving them a chance to actually platform, pro re-platform properly, implement the, the frameworks that need to be successful and compete with the, with the startups and the disruptors. So I wanted to take a look back at what happened at this other age over here. So kind of where we ended up in the age of mass production because things worked there. These companies made it through uh, that turning point. And I had a chance to visit um, the BMW Leipzig plan, which I think is one of the most advanced production, mass production facilities on the planet. So this is uh, what it looks like. And it just, from walking into this building in, in Leipzig, it struck me as just a very different philosophy and mindset to how production and business are connected. And literally from, from when you walk into the building, because once you walk in, so I took this photo, there's my colleague Renee who invited me, you see the assembly line above the office desks moving there. There's this intimate, both in terms of the metaphors of the plan, in terms of the fact that the CIO and all the IT staff wear the same vests as the production workers on the line. Um, you see that there's this intimate relationship between production and the business. And it definitely, you know, I've, I've, I've read all the lean stuff and the Toyota production system, I'd read this book, but it's, I started rereading some of these things I'd read with this view of what I learned on that plant. And if you look at these lean principles, so that, for example, this, these, these, from lean thinking, these are, are the lean principles, that um, value is specified by product, and that you have to identify the value stream for each product, make value flow without interruptions, let the customer pull value from the producer and pursue perfection, those are what the plant was in, in everything it embodied. So for example, the, making the customer pulling value, um, the cars go, are delivered off the line in the same sequence that they were ordered by customers. So it's not just, just in time inventories, it's just in sequence delivery. The entire architecture of the plant embodies these lean principles. That if we look at a bird's eye view, and you can do this, just look, Google for BMW Leipzig on, or on maps, um, if we look at the architecture of the plant, the whole thing matches the business needs of BMW. So over here, you've got, so this is that cool building with the assembly line. Over here, you've got this five finger structure. So this is the assembly line for the one and two series. And it winds its way like this. And the reason it's got that shape is because BMW does not yet know what new innovations might be added to manufacturing steps. We'll actually extend those buildings to add new manufacturing steps. In contrast, so the architecture of the buildings matches BMW's business needs there. In contrast, this really interesting white building, uh, this is the I-Series building, where BMW's actually been able to scale electric car production, and that building can actually reconfigure its own lines uh, in order to scale up electric car production, which we know from recent uh, news stories on Tesla how difficult that can be. Uh, I think two weeks ago, BMW announced that they're going to be delivering another 120 cars uh, a day out of the electric part of this plant. So the entire architecture of the buildings, everything that you see there, is all geared towards meeting the business need and meeting the needs, and it's architected around the value streams, not vice versa. And if you look at how business value flows in BMW, so these quality cars that deliver to your driving pleasure are designed in yearly cycles, but they're delivered every 70 seconds off that plant. Um, Interestingly, though, the creative and the manufacturing process are decoupled. The, the design of the cars, and I had a chance to, to look at that as well, um, the design of the cars is separate. So there is definitely something different, because I was trying to make all the metaphors line up, and they just they don't quite all line up. Um, there's definitely something different happening with the way that business value flows in IT. So we're not delivering the same thing over and over. We're not delivering shrink wrap boxes packaged 
in Ireland anymore, um, of CDs, we're now delivering new, fe we're delivering new features. So our users are not pulling releases, because releases are, if you've got continuous delivery, they're basically available. They're no longer a bottleneck is getting the releases out um, for companies that, that have made it through that. Um, it's the value that customers get, and that value tends to be things like features. And they tend to be designed much more quickly. And the creative process and the manufacturing process are actually the same thing once you've adopted the principles of DevOps. So um, how do we, you know, what, what can we do that? How can we adopt what BMW learned about this product and value stream orientation to the way that we look at um, our own software delivery? And how do we create those manufacturing lines? The only thing is, as, as I kept doing this, uh, our VP products there, Nicole Bryan, I said, Nicole, how do we make ourselves be more linear? Um, you kind of realize, okay, well, what we're doing within our organizations, if we could actually take a look at how information flows in our value streams. You know, just imagine taking this moving MRI of every single IT worker in your company and how they talk to every single business person. You would not end up with a linear manufacturing process. You would end up with something that looks much more like a network of different teams, of different stakeholders, of communications and conversations and artifacts flowing across that network. And that network would not be a network of planes or cities, but it'd be a network of the ground truth of where we work, which is not these assembly robots and rails on the line, but it's the tool chains that we use to implement the business processes and the different workflows in, in building software. And so what we did is we decided that we wanted to understand this a little bit better. How does that ground truth, just like I had a chance to, through this Gemba walk at BMW, witness the ground truth of the Leipzig plant, what does the ground truth look like uh, across the, the Global 500 uh, IT customer base? And so we realized that through our work with our customers, we actually had 308 different tool chains documented across um, a good chunk of the Global 500. And so we did a whole bunch of analysis and research on what was in those tool chains, how are they connected, what were those artifact flows? So, because we never, you know, we've got the Dora report, which has some super interesting statistics, but it's very hard to find cross-industry information on that actual ground truth, on what's happening in the tools and the real work happening, not just what people think is happening, not what, just what they perceive is happening. So what we did is we noticed that, for example, 70% of people connect three different tools. 40% um, of you connect four different tools. Uh, we've got all these integration patterns that are connecting different things in interesting ways, and the artifacts that flow get very interesting. And the really interesting thing is that what we notice is that these flows that you've got within your organizations, they're not linear flows with one team not talking to another team, they're these networks. And these networks have this ad hoc structure, and the biggest problem is that structure is actually aligned to projects. To tends to be aligned to what the PMO set up, or project management set up, as this project structure, which comes from the way that IT work is, is funded. But if you look at what's actually flowing, there seems to be this really massive mismatch because if we look at what's flowing, if we look at the question that business people actually want answers to, they don't want answers to, the answer is not, is this project on track, is this project on track, because the answer is always yes till the end when it's not. Um, the, and that's why I think that that whole view, we, we've now often hear the term watermelons, right, where the, the projects are always green on the outside but red on the inside, and you don't find out until you cut them open. Um, but uh, the... There's some very important questions that business takes always have, like how long will it take to get this, this new feature, this new application to the customer? We need to move fast. We've got this fintech startup disrupting us. Um, how much wait time do we have for these high severity incidents? What's our mean time to repair? Um, or how much, if, if we actually do go ahead and implement these fixes for GDPR to deal with those risks, um, how will that affect our feature delivery? And so these kinds of questions are almost impossible to answer for this kind of project management structure, and so we need to, uh, to look at something different. So to move away, again, you think about the way that what's happening at BMW, and think about what's happening within the project-oriented structure. So you've got this black box with a mapping and status updates on whether projects on track, versus what you saw at that plant, a direct mapping to the business. We know exactly how many cars are going off the line, how quickly they're going off the line, what quality problems there are because of how many of them are going into the rework area. Um, we've got this waterfall orientation, the project structure, where we assume there are these discrete phases, whereas with a proper product-oriented process, it's just about flow. How much flow, how much value can you deliver to the market? Uh, we've got these funding cycles, again, that are more based on budgeting cycles than based on value delivery, where if you learn that you can deliver more value halfway through a cycle because you've experimented some or you've succeeded with an MVP, you can now inject more budget into that. 
Um, and over here, of course, is one of the biggest problems that no mass manufacturing um, uh, business would, would ever implement, which is that you can't reallocate people to different projects because they need time to build up expertise whenever they're building something complex. If BMW were switching people between the electric line and the, and the gas lines, um, that would not work that well whenever they, they restructured projects. So the other thing is, the other, the other key thing is, is how you manage risk. So you try to bake in, in projects, you try to bake in all that risk up front, and whether it's a market fit risk, it's a delivery risk, all of that, you, you bake in up front, you bring in contingencies, and you don't find out until the end of the project, versus what we saw, for example, BMW starting out with the i3 series, but it was probably less clear uh, how many of those there would be demand for until Norway said that they want to go all electric or all zero emissions by 2025, at which point it could make sense to inject more because the risk was lower and the opportunity was higher. So the very big realization, realization I had through this is, when, again, working with a lot of IT leaders across the Global 500, is if we look at, you don't need to read all this, but if we look at the, a little deeper into those different ages, what's happening is that um, each of the ages had managerial innovations that helped them thrive. They had financial capital innovations and so on. And if we look at the age of electricity, that's where Taylorism came from. That's where we learned about separating division of labor and functional specialization. And the age of mass that's the age of electricity. The age of mass production, we learned about Fordism, and we learned how important it was actually to invest in people's expertise and in stable product lines and so on. And the big problem is that most IT organizations are managed two ages back. So they're using managerial systems two ages ago. We haven't even shifted into the age of mass production. So there's this massive gap here, and this is the gap that we need to fill. And so what we've done is tried to collect everything that we know about this and create this new managerial approach to help organizations shift from project to product um, and do basically what the tech giants, what the startups are doing in terms of aligning around product-oriented and value stream-oriented software delivery. And so I'll give you a preview of this. This is a kind of a draft. The book is still in draft. Um, but and it'll, the, there'll be the final version of this thing called the flow framework to help you do this, to create that common language between the, the business side and the IT side um, uh, in, in November at DevOps and Vice Summit in Vegas. But, but here's the preview. So this is the, the flow framework. And the idea is that you align all of your deliver, and I'll have to go through this fairly quickly, but um, you align all of your delivery around these product-oriented value streams. And for each of those value streams, you track both the flow metrics, so the equivalent of the cars, and you track the business results of those metrics, so you can correlate the two. You can say, okay, if I pump out more i3s, do I get more revenue results? Are they being sold? So the flow metrics proposed by the flow framework, are, and I'll go through each of those quickly, are flow velocity, flow efficiency, flow time, and flow load. So these are very much inspired and based on the Kanban community, the Agile community, what's happening in the DevOps community. Um, the business results are value, cost, quality, and happiness. And I'll go into those in a moment as well. But the key thing is the flow framework proposes you only measure four different units. So these are the four things that capture business value, which means each one of the work items, for example, we use, uh, an evolution of the scaled agile framework internally in desktop and scrum processes. So we have dozens of types of work items. Each work item maps into one of these four flow units and they are features, so net new value visible to an end user. That's what customers really want to pull. Defects, so customers pull those as well because they want things to work, not not work. Risk, so this is all of the compliance security work. Uh, that you need to do, and then debts. This is all the technical debt, infrastructure debt, value stream debt potentially if you're missing automation, and all of that. So every single type of work being done by a technical team, by a product and engineering team, fits into each one of those. So, um, and then for each of those, for example, we'll track flow velocity and see how that, you know, how that contributes to value. For example, if I get a higher velocity, if I deliver more features, does that get me more value? And the value can be revenue, it can be monthly active users, it can be whatever your value metric is internally that matches to your strategy, matches to your OKRs, and so on. Cost, and, but the key thing is that value is tracked per value stream. So you're thinking more like BMW than you're thinking more like an enterprise IT shop. You track value for every product, and the activities for that product's value stream are what delivers that. Same thing with cost. You track cost per value stream. So you need to know how many, let's say, full-time 
equivalent do you have on the value stream? How many people in product, how many people doing design, analysis testing are doing it for that value stream? Uh, you track quality per value stream. That might be escape defects, or however you like to track quality. And you track happiness for the value stream, which means, and this is something I actually did learn from, from John Smart. We weren't doing this until I learned that John implemented this at Barclays. Um, you, it, we have been tracking ENPS, Employee Net Promoter Score, for ages. Uh, we now track it for our value stream. So we know, for example, if one team is sitting on a platform that's so difficult to evolve, yet the business side is saying, why can't you get more features out the door? There might be something wrong, because they want to be doing the right thing, but they've not been given the chance to re-platform, to re-architect, to adopt that, that new framework. So, um, so you track for, for those four things, you correlate with the business outcomes, and I'll show you a little bit of each now. So the first and most important thing about each of those is, is their distribution. How much allocation you have to each of these flow units, because these are mutually exclusive and comprehensively exhaustive, which means that if you do more feature work, you can't expect that that won't take away from risk work. So as CEO, the business cannot say, okay, we're now doing GDPR and investing everything in security, and then not expect feature work to decline. And this is part of the core things is that both the business side and the technology side need to understand at least these four concepts. So maybe you know, our CFOs and, and CEOs won't understand what technical data and story points are, but at least hopefully we can get them to speak in, in, in this language. And so here's an example of flow distribution for, for a team, where you, for example, see exactly what happened with a feature flow after a 1.0 release of a product, where, of course, there were more defects and risks that had to get worked on after the thing was released and before it was released, so feature flow declined. And this is the kind of thing that product engineering managers already know how to do. This is their job. The idea is that this is what we need to get the business to understand, is if you're going to have an initial release, well, you need to plan for a, a, a net new feature decline, or if you can do a whole bunch of risk work this quarter, um, you need to make those trade-offs as well. So you don't end up in this Equifax CEO situation where you think all the security work is being done while you're pushing your teams to do all this feature work. To do that accurately, we also need some, a, a better notion of time. And I think we've had a bunch of confusion. This is where I've learned a bunch from Dom Dominica de Grandes' book, Making Work Visible, um, on how we need to have a better understanding of time for software because it is a little bit different than manufacturing. So the flow framework has this metric of flow time. And it's really meant to move us away from this notion that time or lead time is code commit to code deploy. That's a cycle time of development. Um, flow time is really when we accept work into the value stream to when it's finished. So if you want to solve a bottleneck, we don't want to have a team going, yay, we're agile. We want to celebrate when we're bringing business value to a customer faster than we were before. And that's, that's what flow time is all about. So lead time is still very important because lead time is from customer request. But if you're Apple, uh, your, your lead time is basically infinity because you ignore every single support ticket that you get. Apple, Apple does not, this is, fake, this is pretty well documented, they get so many issues reported, same with open source projects. Their lead time is basically infinity because you get so many more customer requests than you can handle. What really matters is when you accept it as delivering value, and that's, that's flow time. Um, flow efficiency is critical, and this is the way that we can actually look at how much time is actively, be, you know, how things are actively being worked on versus how often they're waiting. So that's another key part of the flow framework. And with that, we can create these flow dashboards. So here's just a mock-up flow dashboard where we actually see the flow distribution over time so that we can use that to plan to figure out how to invest in this value stream. We see flow velocity, and we also see flow load. So we can tra track WIP, work in progress, on these value streams and see when we overload them, same effect as with manufacturing, our velocity actually drops. And the idea is that, again, we measure all of this per value stream. And so that's really the goal of the flow framework. And to do that, what we need to do is basically rise above the level of that tool chain, create a model of the value stream through this integration model, and that map that model into our product-oriented value streams. So I won't have time to go through that today, but it's in the book. I should mention you can get a copy of the book at our booth. I'll be um, signing them at the, next, at the next break. But the thing that supports all of this, the same way that the manufacturing line of the plant, which this, you know, the BMW CEO understands, the bottleneck of that manufacturing line, as does every single person in the plant, uh, that, the equivalent of that for us in IT is this value stream network. We have to have a connected value stream network. And we have to have it around, lined around products, not projects. So again, to get rid of these functional silos and uh, move from this world of projects cross-cutting things to these, to these horizontal value streams. And with that, you know, this is what we've been doing at, 
at my company, Antastop, we, we've got this amazing level of visibility. So these are our internal dashboards. I've had to I've obfuscate the revenue and cost numbers because these are <laughs> the real dashboards. But you can see, for example, here that we've got different rates of flow across different teams. And we can see, for example, that risks are such big things that we're taking on that they're actually taking us uh, much more time in terms of flow time than other things are as well. Um, and that this team over here has a more mature uh, set, of, uh, set of frameworks for higher feature delivery while this, this team is still building out their frameworks and so on. And with that, we can answer all these questions we were looking at. How quickly get them to the customer, MTTR, all of that is automatic and real time and visible. So with that, um, the help I'm looking for is if you're interested in this stuff, uh, take a look at the galley copy, that draft copy of the book. Um, sign up for, I'll be publishing uh, every couple of weeks or so, um, a blog post about a part of the book. And then, yeah, please feel free to reach out. And uh, that's my email address if you have any thoughts or ideas on this. So thank you.